Welcome to the Shatter the Stereotypes video podcast. I'm your host, Coach Michael Taylor. And the intention of this podcast is to showcase men of color who are doing amazing things in the world. You see, there's never been a shortage of black male role models. There's only been a shortage of media coverage of those role models. So my intention is to showcase some men who are, again, doing some amazing things in the world. And so joining me today is Raymond Jetson, who is the founder of Metromorphosis. So Raymond, welcome to the show. How are you doing? Michael, thank you so very much for this opportunity. And thank you for the wonderful work that you are doing in sharing the messages that shatter stereotypes. Great. Well, before we jump into your organization, I want to start off with a few icebreaker questions. So let's begin with where are you from? I am from Baton Rouge, Louisiana. I'm a native uh, of the city in which I live at this point. Uh, I spent a couple of years in North Louisiana many years ago playing college football for a bit at a place called Grambling. Uh, wow. And I lived in Phoenix, Arizona for about six and a half years. But other than that, I've been here in Baton Rouge. All right. Well, we've got some connections there because my mom's from Lafayette, Louisiana, and I got a lot of kin folks in Louisiana. So we've got some connections there somewhere, I'm sure. Yes. So, so tell us a little bit about your family, whatever you feel comfortable sharing. Uh, I, I grew up in uh, an environment where family meant everything. Uh, I, I grew up literally living next door for the first 11 and a half years of my life, next door to my great grandmother and great grandfather. Uh, my great grandmother on my father's side and grandmother on my father's side lived one street over. Half of the block that I grew up on was my family. Uh, and so I, I grew up in an environment where family was, was, was everything. I, I would walk when I was in high school, I'd walk to school each day. Uh, and there'd be 20 to 30 members of my family just in this kind wow. of scattered group walking together uh, to, to school. And so... Uh, well, that had to have been a great experience. To it have. was a tremendous experience. Now, tell us a little bit about Tammy. So I met Tammy, um, boy, 33 years ago now at an event where I was a speaker. Uh, she was in the audience. Uh, I, my contention is that she was staring at me. Of course, she has a slightly different version of the story. Uh, and we talked and uh, literally that evening, um, I shared with her that she was going to be my wife. Wow. Uh, and she said that she went home uh, wondering who in the world was this arrogant, uh, <laughs> fill in the blank with, with verbiage not appropriate for the podcast. Uh, <laughs> later ended up being the case. And then you've got Jay, Erica, and Jeremy. Tell us a little bit about so them. So Jerrica is, uh, uh, is the international winner of every daddy's girl contest there is. Uh, Jerrica was born with a rare syndrome. She has uh, Cornelia DeLange syndrome, and so she has growth delays, development delays. Jerrica does not communicate using words, but nevertheless communicates quite well. Uh, and she is, uh, she, she's my heart outside of my body. Uh, and we have just an, an unbelievable bond. My, when Jericho was born, she spent the first 19 days of her life in neonatal intensive care. Tammy was sick and so she could not go. And so I would go to the intensive care uh, four to five times a day to to feed her, to, to try to get her to drink from the little bottles and to hold her so that she had human contact. When she came home, uh, I spent uh, the first month of her life um, at home with her. And so we've just developed this unbelievable bond that exists 28 years later. Uh, Jeremy is uh, my 20 year old son. Uh, who, uh, who is me in so many ways. He is uh, God's way of, of reminding me of, of, of some of the challenges that I presented for my parents uh, and to demonstrate to me that the creator does have a sense of humor. Uh, <laughs> but he is an uh, amazingly bright young man with a very big heart uh, uh, who's searching to find himself at this time. Mm, well, thank you for sharing because that's, once again, one of the stereotypes that we often hear is that as black men, we aren't 
good fathers. And so based on that conversation alone, I'm sure that you're just an incredible dad. I, I try to do the best that I can. I had the luxury of having a wonderful dad uh, who, who unfortunately left this earth far too early. He died at 54. Uh, and I only realized how young that was as I approached my 54th birthday a number of years ago. Mm. So tell us, what are some of the things Raymond does for fun? Uh, I, I, uh, my name is Raymond and I'm a golf addict. <laughs> uh, and, and I need to acknowledge that uh, it is it is uh, as one of my my friends describes it a terribly cruel mistress, uh, and and I am just totally drawn to the game. Uh, it, it is challenging, and so I, uh, when the weather allows and the calendar allows, I, uh, I I'm either trying to play golf or I am practicing some aspect of golf so that I might play better the next time that I play. Uh, I enjoy reading, and so I have a number of books that, uh, that are on my desk <laughs> that I need to work my way through. I'm typically uh, reading a couple of books at a time, and so I'll read a few chapters and then go to another book. And so I, I, I enjoy uh, golf and, and reading. Now, with that being said, name a book that has challenged you to become a better man. Uh, there, there are two that, that are, well, three that I'll mention real quickly. Uh, but one, I, I finished not long ago uh, a, a, a biography on Maynard Jackson, uh, which talked about uh, all of the, the challenges that were transformed into opportunities uh, when he became mayor of Atlanta and overcoming uh, all of the, the, uh, the cries of even African-Americans in Atlanta asking him not to run, did not believe that he could win, uh, whites, business, civic leaders saying that they didn't believe the community was ready for an African-American mayor. But overcoming all of that uh, negativism uh, and having a vision and being able to cast that vision and then being able to literally change the economic landscape uh, of a city uh, and a region. Uh, I mean, Atlanta became a Mecca uh, for people of color, especially, but a Mecca for young uh, uh, and, and uh, motivated uh, professionals and people seeking opportunity, in large part, in my opinion, because of Maynard Jackson and his decision to insist upon uh, uh, African American business participation in the building of the Atlanta airport. It created millionaires, solidified businesses, and changed the economic landscape of a community. And so I was just inspired by, by the example uh, of, of, of Maynard Jackson. I also recently took off my shelf, and I just talk about these two, but I recently took off my shelf a book that I read some years ago uh, that is entitled How to Think Like Leonardo da Vinci. Uh, and it's a really interesting book because it's broken down into seven characteristics of da Vinci. And so, for example, uh, one of them is creativity. And so he would just literally look for opportunities to challenge himself to be creative. And so he was a painter. He was a sculptor. He did writing. He was into astronomy. And so he was just really, really curious and pushing himself uh, to, to be creative. Uh, it's pushing yourselves uh, to expand your comfort zone. And so da Vinci was right-handed, but he taught himself uh, to write immaculately with his left hand uh, to expand himself, to become ambidextrous. Uh, he spoke a multiplicity of languages. And, and so um, I, I find it just, and finally he was a lifelong learner. Uh, and so I, th those are two examples of, of, of readings that have really impacted me. Nice, now, if you could go back in time, knowing what you know now, what advice would you give to your 20-year-old self? Finish what you've started. 
Uh, I was a, a, a young man. I was terribly frustrated with my undergraduate uh, college experience. Uh, one, because uh, first of all, like every 20 year old, including the one who is my son, at 20, you know everything in the world. Absolutely. Uh, and, 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 and you're wondering why these dumb adults and older people around you don't recognize your genius. Uh, and after all, why, why do I need this credential from a college? I mean, I'm, I'm brilliant uh, and I'm ready to go and, and impact the world. And, and so I was not nearly the serious student that I needed to be. Uh, I walked away from, from, from college and moved to Arizona. Uh, and so I tell my 20 year old self to finish what you started because it's, it's a good habit to have uh, in life. Um, and I would remind my, my 20 year old self that for every choice you make, there are consequences. And so you need to not only be focused on the choice, uh, but to pay attention to the consequence mm -hmm. that could emerge from the choices that you make. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, there are some people who are pessimistic about the future. <clears throat> Obviously, if you turn on the television, I can understand why some people might feel that way. And then there are other people who are pretty optimistic about the future. So where do you fall on the spectrum between optimism and pessimism for the future in general? So if on that continuum, if one, Michael, is extremely pessimistic and 10 were unbelievably optimistic. Uh, I, I am somewhere between 8.5 and 9. Uh, I am genuinely and generally uh, very optimistic uh, about the future because I, I believe in the human capacity to, to change, to adapt, to advance, to progress, to make a difference. And so I believe in the human capacity. I believe in the fundamental goodness of the majority of people uh, in, in, in the world. Uh, and so I, I'm, I'm, I'm an 8.5. I believe that if we are committed to making the world better, regardless to the challenges and the uncertainty that we face, that we have the ability to make that difference. The only reason that I'm not a nine or a 9.5 is I think that there are some fundamental challenges that we face as a, as, as a people, as a country, uh, as, a, as, as a community of, of people of color. I think that there are some intrinsic challenges that we face that unless we are able to be honest about them and, and to meet them head on, that we won't be uh, we won't achieve the full potential of, of the opportunity that is before us. Mm. Well said, well said. I, I am definitely on that optimistic side. As a matter of fact, I, I get a lot of pushback because of my optimism. Uh, I consider myself to be an irrepressible optimist with a passion for the impossible. And like yourself, I, I, I do believe in humanity and humanity's ability to overcome the challenges. And ultimately, I believe it's people like yourself who are doing something to improve the quality of life for people that provides me with optimism. When I meet people like yourself, it, it fills me with hope. And, 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 and I can see that, as you mentioned, most people are good people, have good intentions. And unfortunately, we live in a culture and society that focuses so much on negativity that we believe that that's the pervading outlook for most people. But I don't buy that. I, I think the media, again, their whole focus is showing you what's wrong with the world. And I will assert that there are a lot more things that are right with the world than are wrong with it. I would agree, but they don't get ratings or sell subscriptions. Exactly, exactly. So now, as a former minister of um, Star Hill Church, it's obviously obvious that spirituality plays an important part in your life. So I want you to share with the audience, why do you think it's important to have a connection or a relationship with something greater than yourself? I, I read somewhere once uh, that the self-made man is always a small package. 
Uh, and if, if I am the greatest thing that I believe in, if I am the, the most powerful, most uh, knowledgeable, uh, most impactful being that I know, then I live in a world that is limited, that is limited by me, that's limited by my ability, that's limited by my capacity. But when I have relationship with and confidence in an all-knowing, all-powerful, all-wise, all-loving creator, then I can examine what is the impossible for me. And now all things have, 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 have become possible. Uh, someone once remarked that the likelihood of creation as we see it, human beings, the animals, uh, the, the, the functioning of the earth and the sun and the moons, the likelihood of all of that emerging from a big bang is uh, probably proportional uh, with the likelihood of an explosion in a print shop creating an unabridged dictionary. <laughs> uh, and, and, and so there has to be something greater for this to be as it is. And I choose to place faith in this God as I choose to call and as I understand uh, because I find that my life and my experiences are better because of that commitment to that relationship. Well said, well said. So let's talk about metromorphosis. Yeah. Now, my first question is, how did you come up with that name and what does it mean? So fundamental to the inception uh, and the evolution of metromorphosis is this whole nature, uh, this whole notion of transforming inner city communities. Not just doing a program, not just serving a few people, and I don't say that to be critical of some really, really wonderful programs that people run all across this country, but it was not what motivated me. Uh, what, 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 what the passion within me was this question of how do we really transform uh, inner city neighborhoods, the lives of the people and families uh, that live therein. And, and, and so I was just stuck with this whole idea of, of, of a metamorphosis uh, and, and this process by which this uh, very ugly worm, in my opinion, goes into this shell and comes out as this beautiful butterfly. And that's what I had in my heart for the communities like the one I grew up in, uh, and this whole play on words of the metromorphosis, this transformation of the metropolitan area, the transformation of the inner heart, the core of cities was what was the driving uh, force behind the name metromorphosis. Oh, I absolutely love that. Thank you. Absolutely love that, that really, Never thought about it that way, but I, I got the point about the morphosis, and yeah. I, I made the connection, and and I I love the metaphor of the caterpillar to the butterfly, yes. but putting in the context of communities, that's that's really powerful. Well, that's that's the that is what undergirds not only the name metromorphosis, but the work that we do. And speaking of such, what exactly do you do with metromorphosis? So here is the here, here is the the essence of our work, and then I will talk about the specific manifestations of that essence. The essence of our work with Metromorphosis, Michael, is that we help people and organizations transform neglected and broken communities into thriving and vibrant places to live, work, and experience success. Mm. That's the essence of what we do. Now, there are strategies that we uh, undertake to create that essence. 
One of them with which uh, you are most familiar, of course, is the Urban Congress on African-American Males. Uh, we were fortunate to have you join us and spend time and share from, from not only your philosophy of life, but the wonderful book shattering the, the stereotypes. Um, but the Urban Congress on African-American Males is a movement of engaged people in this community that is intended to transform the narrative and the experiences of black boys and men in this community. Uh, and so we have seven uh, goals of the Urban Congress, ranging from leadership and families to healthcare, to generational wealth, to decarceration and reentry. And so that's one iteration, one strategy that we employ to help people and organizations transform neglected and broken communities. The second is the Urban Leadership Development Initiative, which is a year long leadership uh, development effort uh, that we invite and select people who are either residents of inner city neighborhoods, people whose daily work and mission uh, brings them to the inner city neighborhoods, or people whose civic engagement brings them to inner city neighborhoods. And we take a cohort of people each year and take them through a year long experience where we totally challenge their understanding of the practice of leadership and examine strategies that we believe are necessary to truly practice leadership in a way that transforms neglected and broken communities. Uh, into thriving and vibrant places. Wow. The, th the third strategy, just very briefly, Michael, is uh, our schools are excellence. And that is an effort where we engage family members, parents, community members, and school personnel around this whole notion of how do we create excellent schools and excellent opportunities for kids who are still in schools in inner city neighborhoods. Mm. Well, I, I have to admit that I was truly impressed uh, with your conference because as a motivational speaker, you know, people bring me in, I give a presentation, and I notice in most conferences, I don't see any action steps that people are going to take as a result of the conference. And my judgment would be that a lot of people show up just to get the free food. Yeah. But what I noticed in your conference that people were engaged they were engaged in a way that I've never seen in a conference before. I mean, the breakout sessions you had with Ahmad and, 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 and Rod, I was like, wow, this guy's really about transforming the world. So I can see how you are definitely living your mission because you are literally transforming communities by transforming the people within those communities. So I just want to commend you for your efforts because I was truly impressed with your conference. Well, thank you very much. We like to say, Michael, for folks that uh, the people and the organizations who are committed to making a difference, they're the heroes in our story. Uh, we're just the guides. We're helping them uh, to, to move in a direction that allows them to live out what is uh, their desire for, for, for their community. Mm. Now, you also um, did a study, the Urban Congress did a study on black men and boys. Tell us a little bit about that study. So before we began the work, uh, the Urban Congress evolved out of this, this, this kind of anecdotal uh, recognition that in most of the work that we were attempting to do, uh, African-American males were statistically outliers in a number of areas. Uh, unemployment rate, uh, which does not mean that there aren't a number of, of African-American men who are unbelievable employees and employers, but high school dropout rates, uh, access to health care. There were a number of things that had just appeared anecdotally that black boys and men were typically outliers in some of the outcomes being created by systems and structures in our community. But rather than to start an initiative on antidote, uh, we commissioned research. And so we uh, paid to have some research done in the areas of education, uh, healthcare, uh, criminal justice, 
uh, finances and social relationships, social capital. And the report on the state of black boys and men in Baton Rouge is the result of, of, of that investment and in research. And that report became the foundation for the initial convening of the Urban Congress. We literally invited people to the community to, to come and meet. Uh, we drew out of that report what we call 25 compelling statistics about black men. And we put those uh, throughout the room and started a conversation. And what emerged from that is the work that you had an opportunity to see when you recently came to share with the third convening of the Urban Congress on African American Males. Mm. Well, you know, my, my contention has always been that I have a tagline for my business, which is transforming your world from the inside out. Yes. And as a personal coach, life coach, my goal has been to provide insights, information, and wisdom that helps transform men from the inside out. And I know that we are all aware of all the challenges that are yes. out there for men of color. But one of the reasons why I was so drawn and so glad that you and I connected is that we have the same intention, which is once again, to transform ourselves from the inside out through your work and through my books and writing. So I think something that's been missing is a collaboration of men of color who are doing amazing things in the world and letting other men of color know what's available, what's out there, what works, what doesn't work. And that's one of the reasons why I put together this podcast. Because what I wanna do is I wanna attract men of color who are doing some things like yourself and then create links so that people who may be in Baton Rouge didn't know about you, we can put a link there, they can connect, and possibly they can become a part of your organization. So the whole intention is to, is right in alignment with what you're doing, which is transforming the people, which will then transform the communities. And so I wanna just, when you think about your organization, what are, the, what are some of the, the, the future goals that you have for expanding your organization? Are you primarily staying in Baton Rouge? Are you going across the country? Or what are your future goals for your organization? So, so uh, th thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Michael. Let me just, before I answer that question, allow me to say, I think that the work that you have committed yourself to uh, is very, very important. This whole notion of creating a greater awareness of people who are working and as you describe it, doing absolutely awesome work in many communities across our country. And so creating a platform for that connection is something that is really important, uh, needed, and I commend you for it. Uh, there are a couple of, uh, so the Be Me community out of Miami that's led by Trabian Shorters uh, is, is uh, creating connections amongst African-American men. The, the campaign for black male achievement uh, is creating connection uh, between men who are committed to, to black male achievement across the country. But I think that you bring uh, a different slant to it with the podcast, with uh, the, the, the gathering around the books, the literature that you've created and other things. And so I commend you for what you're doing. Uh, one of the things that we have done with, with Metromorphosis is, first of all, if you will recall, I talked to you about the essence of our work, and then I described what people would typically call programs as strategies, and we view them as strategies. Uh, and what that allows us to do is to recognize their experimental, experiential or experimental uh, nature. And so these are experiments. Uh, that will either be proven or disproven to be effective in helping people in organizations to transform neglected and broken communities into thriving and vibrant places to live, work, and experience success. To the degree that they are successful, we are very attentive to the process and the learning so that we will end up with models that can be replicated in other communities. And so, for example, uh, we, with full confidence, 
believe that we could come to uh, a Houston or a Little Rock or a Dallas or pick a city. Uh, we believe that we can legitimately come in, uh, meet with a group of interest holders who are committed to this work and provide for them a framework to do the same work, but in a way that is uh, authentic to their own communities. And so we have the framework. We don't bring the answers. Uh, we bring a process uh, that we have learned from. And so the goal is uh, to identify opportunities uh, to expand this work uh, with authenticity uh, to where people recognize that there are strategies that, that, that allow them to take their well-meaning and sincere desire to change the world, uh, that there are platforms that will support them in doing that. And so we want to expand our work and make it available to other communities. Nice. Well, again, what I'll be doing is I'm, I'm going to put together a on, on my website a resource page that will connect men like yourself and organizations like yourself so that we have those resources and connections available to men who are also committed to the same things that we are. So with that being said, um, you know, one of the things that I'm, I'm, I'm really passionate about is entrepreneurship. Yes. And I believe the key to resolving the majority of the problems in our communities lies within our ability and willingness to create businesses. And so from an entrepreneurial standpoint, I want you to just kind of reflect back on the challenges that you had to overcome in starting Metromorphosis. Because as an entrepreneur, you know, it's easy to have dreams about starting this business, but, but the reality is it's difficult, it's challenging. And so what were some of the obstacles you had to overcome when starting your organization? So thanks. So one of the first challenges, and, and I, I, when I have an opportunity to speak to groups and individuals who are interested in making a change, whether it's through uh, social enterprises like Metromorphosis or for-profit businesses, I share with them uh, that it's important to understand the distinction between the, the content and the container. What is the essence of what it is you're trying to do? That's the content. How you go about doing it is the container. And I find that sometimes we become more preoccupied with the container than we do the content. And so being real clear about what is it that, that you are trying to do and how can you express that in a sentence to others uh, so that they are really clear and you are really clear on what it is that, that you are uh, attempting to do. And that's true whether you are starting uh, uh, a deep sea diving supply store or if you are doing uh, uh, landscape architecture, uh, being, being certain about what is the essence of what you are attempting to do. Uh, the, the second uh, thing that I believe is critically important is that we have to educate ourselves. We have to become uh, knowledgeable of the things that we want to do. Uh, there are reasons that a significant uh, percentage of startup businesses and organizations fail. Uh, understand what those are. And, 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 and so take the time to be a learner, to understand the ecosystem in which your business interest or uh, innovation would, would sit in. And so understand that uh, very, very clearly. The third thing, Michael, that I say, which is critical, is understand the money. Understand the finances. Understand what it costs for you to do it. Understand how much money you have to make in order to meet payroll or to pay bills. Uh, what, what do you have to do in order to actually make money? Uh, and, and what are you going to do with that money? Uh, one, of the, one of the pitfalls that I see uh, so very often in, in entrepreneurial startups and, and social enterprises that are nonprofit in nature is, is people spend or withdraw their profits or excess revenues 
far too early. Reinvest in your business, build the infrastructure, build the capacity within your nonprofit so that you can continue to generate our revenues. And the final thing that I would, would, would say that was really important for me in, in this effort, and I encourage others, in whether it's a social enterprise or a, an entrepreneurial business startup, is diversify your resource, uh, the, the revenue stream. Uh, create as many viable opportunities uh, to access revenues as you possibly can or in the wisdom of our elders, don't put all your eggs in one basket. Uh, you know, understand what are things that are on the periphery or the tangent of what it is that you are doing that you might be able to create additional revenue streams. Mm. Good advice. Now, most people are afraid of failure. As a matter of fact, I think it's that fear that keeps most people from even starting or attempting uh, to start a business. And I actually believe failure is a good thing if we're open-minded enough to learn from those failures. Um, so from your perspective, what is, what is something that you may have, it may have appeared you failed, but yet you learned a valuable lesson in that failure? Well, metromorphosis, the evolution of metromorphosis and the strategies uh, that we currently employ, Michael, uh, are the product of multiple failures. Uh, you know, one of the things that we actually teach in our Urban Leadership Development Initiative is you want to fail as quickly and as inexpensively as possible. And so that means that you have to be willing to experiment and to recognize that, that, that what failure actually is, is an opportunity to learn from the approach. Uh, that, that, that you employed and to adapt and do it differently. What I find, and it goes back to that content container, people become so committed to their own way of doing it uh, that they, they have to hit the bottom before they admit that it's not going to work. We encourage people to start with the mindset of this intervention, this effort that I'm about to undertake is what I believe at this point in time to be the absolute best thing to do. But I might be wrong. Mm -hmm. And when you are able to manage that tension, then you receive failure as in, in a very different way. This was an experiment. I thought that this was a viable way to do business. I thought that this was a viable way to make a difference in people's lives. I thought this was a viable way to do X. But currently, the feedback that I am getting says that I was not correct. And so now, how do I need to adapt? Uh, I mean, failure is an absolutely wonderful teacher and an opportunity to adapt and move in a different direction. Yeah, a couple of, couple of things that I, I, I live by. One is fail fast, learn faster. Yeah. <laughs> and number two is one of my mentors is a guy named Wayne Dyer, who unfortunately passed away a year or so ago. But he taught me something about failure that, that really sticks with me and it, it really makes a lot of sense. And he says, there's really no such thing as failure. There's only the non-attainment of a desired result. Yeah. So too many times we get attached to failure because if we fail, we think it's a reflection of us. We feel awful about it that I'm not good enough or, you know, I can't do this. And so we internalize this thing called failure and, and it, it destroys us inside. But if we recognize that, it's really not failure. You just didn't attain the desired result that you were looking for. So here's an opportunity to figure out another way to do it. And so I, I, I know that someone who has experienced, let's just say, all types of adversity, it is that lesson that has allowed me to overcome a lot of obstacles and failures in my own life. So, and Michael, I love the whole notion of a non-attainment of, 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 of a desired outcome because the focus on that 
is the desired outcome. It is not an indictment of me as a person. Exactly. Uh, it, it's not a statement about my intellect, my self-worth, my capacity. It's, it's not a, um, you know, a statement on any of those. It is that I was not able to achieve this desired outcome for any number of reasons. Yeah, yeah, very powerful stuff. Now, the key to any successful organization is its leader. I, I really believe that. And so what do you do to ensure that you're the best leader possible for your organization? Uh, one of my oft-repeated phrases uh, and it's not original to me, it may be a John Maxwell quote, I'm not certain, uh, is, is that everything rises and falls based on leadership. And I truly believe that. Uh, I also, and, and I know that this is a, a John Maxwell statement because it is from the 21 laws of leadership, and it is the law of the lid. And what the law of the lid says is that uh, that which is in a container will never be able to rise higher than the lid that is on the container. Mm. And so if you want to grow the contents of the container, you have to be able to raise the lid. Uh, and so as, as a person practicing leadership with others, I have to make certain that I am continually raising the lid so that those who are in the container can rise and grow. And so my responsibility is, is not only to my continued self-development for my own benefit, but for the benefit of those who are around me. Uh, I believe that the ultimate uh, demonstration of the effective practice of leadership is others who are practicing leadership effectively around you. And so uh, I don't believe that uh, an organization can be effective if there's only one person who has the absolute right to practice leadership. Everybody has a leadership responsibility in the organization, and it's my responsibility to help them grow in that. Mm -hmm. And so I continually uh, stretch myself. Uh, I am always reading, uh, attending conferences and learning opportunities that I think stretch me and increase my capacity in the practice of leadership so that I might be able to make a difference in the lives of others. Yeah, and I, I love what Anthony Robbins said. He said, the key to success is constant and never ending improvement. Yes. And that's what I hear, that's what I hear you saying. And I think you're absolutely right. That's what makes a great leader, constant and never ending improvement. Now, how important is the support network, or shall I say the team of an organization? So obviously we've got great leaders sometimes, but what about the team underneath? How important is it to put together a team that shares that same vision that you have to ensure your success? Uh, Peter Drucker said, uh, culture eats strategy for breakfast. And one of the things that I say uh, to the people around me is that chemistry trumps credentials. Ooh, uh, I like that. I and, like and, and so uh, I believe that it is really important that you find the most talented people who are compatible with the culture you are seeking to create and maintain in the organization. Uh, because it is possible to get someone who is absolutely brilliant uh, at the skills that they bring to a particular task and organization and hinder the effectiveness of the organization because the chemistry doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I believe in the whole concept of team. Uh, we describe ourselves in Metromorphosis as the Metromorphosis team. Uh, we all have roles. Uh, and, and we seek to, to create great clarity with those roles. We seek to, to provide effective support for those roles, but we also seek to execute a firm accountability uh, in those roles. And, and so uh, Metromorphosis 
will rise and fall based upon my leadership, but it will ultimately live out its vision based upon the people that I'm able to surround that vision with and to help them gain ownership uh, of that vision. The ultimate testimony uh, to, to my practice of leadership within Metromorphosis is that when I am not here, the organization still functions at its maximum effectiveness. Mm. Beautiful, beautiful. Well, I just want to say first and foremost is I'm absolutely honored to have connected with you. And I know that there are no accidents in a perfect universe. And we have been brought together to do some amazing things to move humanity forward. And I'm looking forward to whatever that next chapter might look like. And so I want to take this moment right now just to say thank you for sharing your wisdom and being my first guest on the Shadow the Stereotypes video podcast. And I knew you would be perfect for it. Uh, but now I'd like to give you an opportunity just to sort of close with some closing words of wisdom for the people who are watching this video, and primarily men of color who, again, who unfortunately in a lot of cases may not get the positive exposure to people like yourself. So what words of wisdom do you want to get, leave them with as we close this session? I believe that the, the critical linchpin in the transformation of inner city neighborhoods uh, or black boys and men. And I believe that it is an absolute necessity that, that we lead and that we are willing to serve one another, that we are willing uh, to share, to love, to honor and respect one another, that we are willing to support one another, to encourage one another, to sacrifice for one another's well-being because I believe that we are the key to our own freedom. We are the key uh, to, to reaching uh, our greatest potential. And that as uh, men of color are able to thrive just in vibrant uh, and, and ever increasing numbers, uh, when the assets that we are are expanded uh, dramatically, uh, that our families are transformed, our neighborhoods are transformed, our businesses are transformed, our communities are transformed. And that which has been neglected and broken all of a sudden becomes thriving and vibrant. Uh, and we are the key to that, Michael. Uh, but we have to be willing to support one another, to encourage one another, to sacrifice for one another, and to, to live up to our commitments. We have an obligation uh, to our families and our communities. Let's live up to it to the best of our ability. Yes, sir. Amen to that. Now, how can people reach you if they're interested in learning more about you and your organization? What's the best way for them to reach you? Well, the, the website is uh, www.metromorphosis, M-E-T-R-O-M-O-R-P-H-O-S-I-S.net, metromorphosis.net. Uh, I can be reached via email at raymond at metromorphosis.net. Uh, and so I uh, would love to, to, to hear uh, if someone, particularly men of color, wanted to look at our work with the Urban Congress, uh, they could either go to the Metromorphosis website or go directly to uh, theurbancongress.com, theurbancongress.com. Great. And I'll also have links below the video. So for those of you who are viewing this, the links will be below the video. Uh -huh. so Raymond, I just want to say once again, thank you, my brother, for the contributions that you're making to the world. And I want to close with a simple idea to the viewers. And that idea is become optimistic. Now, I recognize all the challenges that are out there, and it can seem overwhelming. But I'm reminded of what the good book once said. And it said, be ye not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. So change your mind if it's not positive. 
make it positive because you have access to something that I would call divinity. You have a spark of God within you. It's your responsibility to tap into that. So this podcast is about providing some insights and wisdom that can inspire and empower you. But you've got to be willing to do the work. You've got to make the investment in yourself and make a commitment to yourself, as Raymond said, to make a difference in the world. So it has been my honor and pleasure to share this information with you, and I look forward to seeing you in the next session of Shadow of the Stereotypes video podcast. Take care.